Happy Sunday, TJ here, and welcome to City Church Online. And a happy Father's Day to all of our fathers, father figures, and dog dads. If this is your first time joining us, thanks for being here with us. If you're watching live, feel free to play along with us. If you're watching the broadcast, you can skip ahead for direct access to City Church's online Sunday service. Join in on the conversation, catch up with some old friends, make some new ones. In celebration of today, I want you to tell me your favorite dad joke. Don't hold back, share it in the comments section, and let's all laugh out loud together. Right, City Church? Hey guys, are you grateful for your time here? Because I sure am. And uh, if you're also grateful, why don't you share that on social media? You can do that with Instagram and Facebook and make sure you tag your favorite church at Love Hope City. And for those of us that aren't as tech savvy, you gotta use that share button and you can invite all of your friends. And we even encourage you guys to host your own watch parties because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the corn. Love Hope City. Don't forget to tag your favorite church. On a scale of like amazing to beyond amazing, how great are these tutorials? Well, let us know what you think. If you have something creative or fun you'd love to share, we would love to hear it. Put it in the comment section, but I'm gonna do something better for you. I'm gonna give you top secret confidential access to the worship pastor where you can get your ideas directly to her. It is Krizel at lovehopecity.com. But you didn't hear that from me. 
Hey City Church, I'm gonna teach you how I make pancakes at home. Okay, start with one overripe banana with one tablespoon of butter. Add lemon and vanilla extract and one quarter cup of almond meal. Crack open an egg, stir it up real good and add one cup of milk, but just start with a little bit, stir it in there and add the rest. We're gonna add one half cup of oatmeal, which you won't even notice. One cup of flour, whole wheat or regular is just fine. A bunch of cinnamon, some baking powder, I don't know, a couple teaspoons, cover the top. Stir it up. Optional quarter cup of walnuts and chocolate chips. Mmm. You may have noticed I added no salt to the recipe. Well, if you're anything like me, you like bacon with your pancakes, and I still have some salty goodness in this pan, you know what I'm saying? Please make sure your pan is nice and hot so you see these butter bubbles. Beautiful. You don't want your first batch to be weird. By the way, I find that one quarter cup is just the right size for my pan, and I do three at a time for a three stack of pancakes per person, but figure out what works for you. Add only natural maple syrup. Take a bite and enjoy. You know what time it is? It's time for a movement break. So it's time to get off your feet and get the blood flowing so that we can be prepared for this amazing worship that we're about to be hit with and this amazing message by Pastor Kyle. Let's get moving. All right, guys, are you ready to move? Okay. Let's start first with just touching our toes. Nice and easy. Uh, let your head maybe dangle and shake a little bit side to side. Come back up. Let's stretch our backs a little bit. Put your hands back here above your tush and give yourself a nice little back stretch. Yeah. Okay, now you know you gotta get the worship arms ready, so uh, let's first get our worship space worked out. Oh, with some washing machines. This gets the Holy Spirit invited, you know, in a cycle, if you will. Spin cycle around you. All right, let's get the arms motion, because you know you gotta be raising them arms to heaven soon, even if you're in the living room. And uh, maybe if you're a dancer, just, you know, make it a little bit harder for yourself. Get yourself really into it. All right, well, it's that time. We got on our feet. Now it's time to grab your Bible. Make sure you have your cup of coffee nearby or tea, whichever your preference is. And let's get ready for an amazing time of worship and one amazing word from Pastor Kyle. Let me tell you, it's a real good one this week. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us. We're so happy that you're here.
Welcome to City Church Online. Hey, the first thing we want to invite you to do is to grab your phone right now and go to lovehopecity.com forward slash response and fill out a digital worship response card. Go ahead and fill that out in its entirety and we would love to know if there's any way that we can be the church to you or if you have updated contact information that you'd like us to know about. But the part that we love is that section at the bottom that's there for prayer requests. And if you would have something that we could pray for you uh, for. We would just love to lift you up. And uh, so go ahead and do that. And while you're doing that, we're going to go ahead and we're going to transition to our time of offering. And I just want to encourage you to get involved in trusting the Lord with your finances. And here at City Church, you can give in one of three simple ways. Uh, You can do it through the web on any web-enabled mobile device at lovehopecity.com forward slash give. Uh, The easiest way that I always encourage you to do it is through the Church Center app on your phone. There, There goes my notes. And so you can just grab the Church Center app, set up City Church as your church on there. And after that, it just takes a matter of moments to give. And if all that techie stuff is a little too tricky for you, uh, you can do it the old school way by sending us a letter in the mail uh, to City Church, P.O. Box 587, Anaheim, California, 92815. Thank you for your continued generosity and your continued trust in God. Enjoy the rest of the service. When does a joke become a dad joke? When it becomes a parent. So I had a dream that I was a muffler last night. I woke up exhausted. So my son asked me yesterday, Dad, did you get a haircut? I was like, no son, I got them all cut. How do you make a Kleenex dance? You put a boogie in it. (laughs) My father was driving in a car with his young son one day. I looked over at his son and said, hey, take a look outside the window and tell me if you know where we're at. His son looked around and said, dad, I have no idea where we're at. His father replied back to him, well, then you must be lost. Thinking about for a second, he turns to his dad. He said, no, dad, I'm not lost. I'm with you. What do you call somebody with no body and no nose. Nobody knows. <laughs> There's a big difference between dad jokes and bad jokes. And that difference is the first letter. I was wondering why this frisbee was getting bigger and bigger. And then it hit me. What do you call a cow with a twitch? Beef jerky. (laughs) Hey, do you guys know what you call a man who can't stand? Neil. (laughs) Why is my hand like a lemon pie? Because it's got meringue on it. What do sprinters eat before a race? Nothing. They fast. What's brown and sticky? A stick. What did the pirate say on his 80th birthday? I'm mighty. (laughs) Okay guys, why is Captain Hook's crocodile always on time? Because he has a good internal clock. (laughs) What did the buffalo say to the son when he dropped him off at school? Bye son. That's how it is us and our Heavenly Father. Have a good day. Okay, you'll laugh later. I never don't.
is your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness and I Okay, so every year at City Church on Father's Day, we do a push-up contest, and then we do an advanced version that's burpees. This year, church looks a little different these days, so it is going to be me against my friend, Eddie Lancaster over here. Give it up for Eddie. So the rules of the game are chest all the way to the floor, and your feet have to leave the ground when you jump on the top. Max burpees in 60 seconds.
did you have? I don't know. How many do I have? 36? Yeah, that sounds right. 33 or two. Yeah, 33. We have a winner. Thanks everybody for watching. Well, happy Father's Day. All the dads out there. You know, of all my titles that I have in life, Christian, husband, pastor, friend, boss, coworker, you name all the titles that are there in your own life. Of all of those titles, that title of dad is just so special to me. We were told that we would never be able to have children and God did a miracle and now we have two. <laughs> So Father's Day for me is always a little bit extra special. But I know that for many, Father's Day can be a hard day uh, that some of you might be tempted not to go to church or not to tune into the church service, even if it's online. And there's a whole host of reasons why Father's Day can be a hard day uh, for all of us. But I want to encourage you today, if Father's Day is a hard day for you, to remember that you have a heavenly father. There's a song that says, I have a father. He knows my name. And he knows your name. Some of you, though, you know that in your head intellectually that you have your heavenly father. And, and that's a great thing. And it's an encouraging truth for you. But it sometimes just feels like you would love to have a person that you could talk to and that you could touch uh, at times. Well, I want to remind you that Psalm 68 5 says that God is the father to the fatherless. And as our father to the fatherless, God also gives us father-like figures at different places in our lives to encourage us along the way. And so if you can't, uh, or it's a tough day for you for uh, uh, any host of reasons, I want to encourage you to think of a father like figure in your life that you might be able to honor and thank God for today. For me, Father's Day is just another day that I get to be dad. <laughs> I get to be a husband. I get to do the dishes. I get to be at home right now. How many of you guys are home a lot these days? You know what I'm talking about? We're all home these days. That's where we live. And uh, so for me, Father's Day in some senses is just another day, but in other senses, it's such a special day to remind me of what God has done for me. Uh, God also has blessed me with the wonderful earthly father. I know that not everyone has that. God has also blessed me with the wonderful earthly father-in-law. And God has also blessed me with many, many, many spiritual mentors in my life. And I frequently remind myself that I am here today because I stand upon their shoulders and the investment that they have made in uh, my life. To those of you who are dads out there, I just want you to know that your quiet obedience to the Lord has unimaginable impact. The simple things like uh, teaching your family in the ways of the Lord, being a good husband, being a good dad, taking your family to church, over the long haul of your life, those things are going to make a massive impact in the life of your children. My message title today is the son's thoughts on fathering. And uh, in the Bible, we, there's this teaching known as the Trinity. It's this principle of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We serve a triune God. It's one God in three persons. Jesus is not the Father. I have heard people confuse that many times. Um, and yet, we're going to see here in 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20, we're going to see Peter talk about Jesus. And really what we're going to see are some amazing qualities that any father should seek to emulate. But more than that, really just any follower of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, should seek to emulate. So that's why I've called this message, The Son's Thoughts on Fathering. All right, so if you got a Bible, go ahead and open it up to 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. If you don't have a Bible, download the YouVersion app and you can follow along that way. And uh, as you turn and swipe there, we are going to see that the book of Peter just continues on. You know, when we read the Bible, uh, we read with chapters and verses, but those weren't there in the autographs or the original versions of the letter. It was just written like a letter that they would read in its entirety. So what we're going to read today really picks up right where we left off last week. So we're going to read 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you are 
such a good father. And today, Lord, on Father's Day, as we think about dads and, and we think about, uh, for some of us, how that's a hard thing, for some of us, that's a good thing, and maybe for some of us, that's a mixture of all of that. Uh, Lord, we're just grateful for the fact that you give us your presence in our lives. You give us dads, you give us father-like figures, and Lord, you also are our father that we look to at all times. So we pray today that you would open our eyes to see what you want us to see. We pray that you would open our ears to hear what you want us to hear. And we pray most importantly that you would open our hearts, that we would respond and become the disciples you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water." Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Uh, and so last week when we were looking at 1 Peter 3, 15, it mentions that we are to always be ready to give an account or to make a defense to anyone who asks us for a reason for the hope that's within us and yet to do it with gentleness and respect. And then in verses 16 and 17, it talks about rejection and it mentions that people won't always take to that message well, but it's our calling as followers of the Lord Jesus when they ask to put it out there regardless of whether whether they receive us or reject us. And then right now we've just seen in verse 18, it points to Jesus's model of how to deal with rejection. Uh, Jesus, the righteous one, took rejection and suffering upon himself because it was what God wanted him to do. Um, so today we're gonna be looking at Jesus's traits from 1 Peter 3 that reflect the heavenly father and that reflect how we should be as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a note taker, you like to jot things down, the first thing you might wanna write down is that Jesus suffered so we could be safe. You know, Jesus suffered on the cross for our sins to bring us safely home to God. In fact, that is actually how the New Living Translation translates that verse, that he brings us safely home to God. Um, and, and Christ suffered so that we could be safe. You know, safety often comes at the cost of someone else's suffering. And in life, we have uh, safety and we have wisdom and we have impact and somewhere in there we have to make our decisions about what's best for us in a given set of circumstances. Uh, you know, if everyone only did what was safe in their life, no one would ever do anything amazing. <laughs> When I think of some of the most amazing stories that are out there uh, that have been had books written about them and movies made about them, almost in every single case, you see someone who was willing to suffer for the safety of another. They were willing to put their life on the line. Uh, you know, I, I think of the great stories from the Civil War of people who housed and hid slaves as they were trying to make their way to the north so that they might have the hope and chance of a free life. And of course, there are many great stories of how they got away, they got to the north and they found their free life. And there are also other stories where they were caught and, and everyone inside suffered treacherous consequences as a result of it. I think of the great stories of heroism like in World War II, uh, when Christians in many cases, German Christians, housed and hid German Jews uh, and, and placed their lives on the line so that those German Jews could be safe and try to avoid the Holocaust. And there are many stories where that wound up happening and they wound up being safe, but there are also many stories where they were caught and everyone was killed, and it didn't work out that way. You see, safety often comes at the cost of someone else's suffering. Uh, and you know, those are examples of folks who suffered 
physically, to bring other people to physical safety. But what Jesus did is Jesus suffered for us to bring us to spiritual safety. Jesus suffered so we could be spiritually safe. But you know, we must take his hand. Uh, You know, I love these superhero movies. I'm a big superhero movie. I see you got your uh, Black Panther shirt there. I'm a big fan of that movie. Love it. Uh, I love superhero movies. If Mar- I wish Marvel would come out with a movie every day because it would give me something to do during pandemic. You know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, so I love these superhero movies, and I, and I love in the end when, when there's some guy or gal reaches down and because someone else is hanging off of a cliff, you know, and down there at the bottom there's just peril and clouds and who knows what, and then all of a sudden you see a hand come and they grab it, you know what I mean? And then you see the scene where the other person grabs the hand and they pull them up to safety. I, I love these kinds of movies. Um, well, let me say, I think that in reality, That's you and me every day. We are hanging off of a cliff in life every day that we are here on planet Earth. I hope that this pandemic has reawakened the world to the reality of their mortality. I hope that this pandemic causes people to realize that they really aren't safe here on planet Earth. Some of you are like, man, really? Is that what you said? I'm never going to this church again. You want me to feel like I'm not safe coming here? I mean, this is weird. Uh, You're looking for an exit door around here. No, seriously, I, I do. I hope that this pandemic makes people awakened again to the fact that every day that we're here, we're not safe. See, there, there is only one difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Uh, see, we're not better than someone who doesn't know the Lord. We're better off than they are because we have taken the hand of God. See, we are always only one breath away from heaven. The myth that people have bought into has been that we're safe here. We're not safe here. That's why we talk about our eternal life, our spiritual life, that there has to be more than what we experience on this side of heaven. See, Jesus suffered on the cross to bring us safely off the cliff of death, of life, to bring us into the hope of eternal life. You know, just like Jesus uh, dads often sacrifice for their families and, and have to do things that uh, are tough but just need to be done. I want to ask a question with a show of hands, and this is honest. Uh, this is totally honest, so, uh, or be honest, because this is church, and, you know, Jesus knows and he's watching and all that. Um, has anyone in here ever taken a beat down before? Anyone in here, uh, you've had a beat down? Oh, wow, okay, we had a lot of people had a beat down in here. I was thinking maybe one or two. Um, I'm raising my hand, but I have never had a beat down. Uh, one time in junior high, I had some punk kids kind of shove me around, and I probably called it a beat down and cried when I got home at the time, but it was not a beat down, okay? It was just like a moment that I had in junior high school. But I'll tell you this, if someone ever came into my life and they were, I could feel like they were gonna give me a beat down, here's what I would do. Man, I would run as fast as I can because I'm a runner and I'd, be, I'd put money on these legs. You know what I'm talking about? I'm like, dude, I can do eight miles. How many can you do? Three? You're going to be huffing and puffing. I'm going to be going and I'll lap you. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm going to be doing. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you what. There's one difference. If someone came into my home and I felt seriously like the safety of my family was in jeopardy, you bet your bottom dollar. I would take that beat down to give my wife as much time as physically possible to get the kids out of the house so that they could be safe somewhere else. Um, and, And I think really that's what every good dad would do. Here's the thing. That's how God feels about every single one of us. Jesus took a beat down for you. He suffered on the cross so you could be not just physically safe, but you could be spiritually safe. Here's the second thing you might want to write down if you're jotting things down. Jesus has always been patient when we are on the wrong path. In 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20, which we just read, it says that God waited patiently in the days of Noah. And I'm going to unpack this little part to you right now. The next thing I'm going to talk about might be a little bit strange, but I want you to say something with me out loud. Say this out loud with me. The point is God's patience. Say it. 
Okay, the point is God's patience. So there's this really strange verse that we're gonna look at now where Jesus went after he died on the cross and the Bible says that he went and he preached to spirits in prison uh, and specifically that those were people who were from Noah's day who never repented. Now, every time I read this verse, I scratch my head and I say, what is going on here? Any of you ever thought that when you come across this verse before? And, and, and I think to myself, who were these people that Jesus went and he preached to? Okay, well, they were the unsaved dead people of Noah's day. So that's the first thing to know about who they were. And to kind of unpack a little bit more about them, let's actually go back and look at them from the book of Genesis chapter 6. And I'm going to specifically read verses 5 through 8. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, this is what it says about the people that Jesus went and preached to after he died on the cross. These are the people. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of land of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So these people were people who obviously didn't like God very much, didn't listen to God, didn't do what God wanted or asked. And these were people that were clearly not on Noah's salvation boat. Now, if you look back in the story of Noah, what it really is is a whole picture of salvation, that everybody who chose to receive what God said, they got on the ark and they were safe. And that's kind of this picture of how we are. When we put our faith in Jesus, we're in God's ark of salvation and, and we're safe. And so the people who uh, Jesus went and preached to was everybody else who chose not to get on Noah's ark of salvation. So to let, like, unpack this a little bit more for you, uh, Jesus went to hell, to preach to people who had rejected God. And so whenever I read this, I think to myself, number one, why did he go to hell? (laughs) That's kind of, anybody else, like, why did he go to the spirits in prison? Uh, Secondly, what did he say to them? Any of you ever thought of that? Like, did he go down there to give him another chance? Did he just make a proclamation of sorts and then leave? Did he go be like, told you so, peace out, and then left? (laughs) I mean, we, we don't really know. So let me tell you, my theologically profound and thought through answer of what was going on here in this story. And if you've been going to City Church for a while, come on, help me out. I have no idea. Theologians have been baffled by this verse for millennia. I will not solve the question for you today. Uh, You know, maybe he did give him a chance. Maybe he just made a proclamation. We don't really know. Here's what we know. What did I tell you the point of the story was? The point is God's patience. The whole story, everything he's talking about is about the patience of God. You know, even the whole story of God destroying the world during the time of Noah, that, that story isn't actually about God destroying the world. It's about God saving the world. It's about God for years upon years upon years saying, hey, there's an ark. You can, if you get on it, you're going to be safe. And, and people just repeatedly choosing not to listen to that reality. Uh, anybody in here know how many years it took Noah to build the ark? Anybody? About 75, most likely. And I don't know about you, but to me, that's a pretty long time. And so God gave them a long time to prepare for this coming crisis. And here's the point. God was patient. He, he kept saying to them, here's, here's your chance at salvation. If you, if you get on this, you're going to be okay. And, and so as this whole thing unfolded, eventually the, the waters came and, and then the seas began to rise and they shut the doors of the ark and all those people perished. Uh, well, just like God was patient with the people of Noah's day and God was patient to the people that Peter was writing to, I want to tell you that God is patient with us today. Um, and, And Jesus went to the very people who would never respond to God in prison, the Bible tells us, probably hell, and he preached to them one more time as an example of the patience of God. Uh, You know, God is patient with us 
when we are on the wrong path. But eventually, all of us come to a point in life where God gives us over to our ways. I don't think it's that the patience of God runs out for us because I believe God's patience is infinite. I think what happens is after a while, God's like, well, you've made it abundantly clear what you want to do, so I'm just going to let you go and have at that. If that's what you think is better for you, go on. Um, and there's a story in the Old Testament of this guy by the name of Pharaoh, and he, uh, the Pharaoh sees miracle after miracle after miracle done, and instead of softening his heart towards God, he hardens his heart. And so what we see uh, that eventually happens is God God gives him over to what he already wanted to do, which was to reject God. So I think the same thing is true with us. God is patient with us, but there comes a point where God says, fine, if you're not going to listen, I'm going to let you go and do whatever it is that you want to do. I'm here to remind you today that God is patient with you when you are off track. Uh, God continues to wait upon us time after time after time. You know, sometimes we wind up off track and uh, we kind of like to explain it away like we didn't know what we were doing. No, we knew exactly what we were doing when we got off track, didn't we? <laughs> it's like, oh, I didn't know where that road wound up. <laughs> yeah, you knew. you knew. You knew where it would go. You knew that that choice would lead to that path and that most likely once you got there that the next set of events would unfold. And, and so God is not fooled by us. And honestly, we aren't really fooling anyone either. We know where we're going. We think that sometimes our path to happiness will get us to where we want to get to faster. Um, and, and the reality is we start looking around for operation warp speed to our own happiness. <laughs> That was a coronavirus joke that did not land, for the record. I'll just put that one out there. Trump has Operation Warp Speed, and apparently I'm the only one who's read about it. Okay, I'm moving right along with my notes here today. This is just like old school church where people don't laugh at my jokes for everyone watching online. There it goes. Um, here's the point. You want to know where our own path leads? Our own path leads to floods that wipe us out. Our own path leads to whales that swallow us. <laughs> Our own path leads to unnecessary life lumps that Jesus already paid for and somebody else already paid the dumb tax for so you don't have to do it. That's where our own path leads to. Our own path doesn't speed up anything. If anything, it slows us down. It gets us off track with God. And so in scripture, we see the patience of God over and over and over again. But there comes a point where God says, enough is enough. Shut the doors of the ark. We're moving on with what we said we were going to do. You know, unbelievers look at something like that and they see the cruelty of God. How could he let all of those people perish in this incident? But when I read the story of Noah, I don't see the cruelty of God. I see the patience of God. He gave them so much time. And yet there came a point where uh, God said, okay, that's enough. We're moving on. He waited and waited. You know, frankly, I get impatient when my kids are misbehaving from time to time, specifically Nigel, my little girl. She's too cute and little. She, oh man, I just can't get enough of her. But my kids teach me stuff about myself. Any of you parents in the room, you can relate to that one. Um, and like, for, for example, little Nigel, he has dad's verbal skills and argumentative ability that some of you have grown to appreciate over the years. <laughs> um, he has mom's good looks, man, and, and just her laser focus on ability to do certain things. And he has both of our stubbornness. And so when I tell him that there is something he needs to do that he doesn't want to do. It can be very hard to get Nigel <laughs> off track because he's very articulate. He can argue with you a ton of reasons a little three and a half years old about why he doesn't want to do it. And he's just so focused on his task and he's so stubborn and he doesn't want to get off of that thing. You know, people told us when our kids were, were, were getting closer to two, when Nigel was getting closer to two, that, oh, you know, you just wait for the terrible twos. Anybody ever heard that? You just wait. They're coming. You know, for us, man, two was beautiful. Oh, my goodness. Two, he was sweet. He was docile. He was cooperative. Man, the closer that child got to three years old, that's when the thrombosis threes started. I don't know. I just made that up. That's not even a word. But you get the point. 
And I started to see so much of myself and my own impatience in my own son. And I have to remind myself sometimes that I am the parent who's supposed to be in control. I'm the parent who is supposed to be patient. And, uh, you know, I'm always transparent with you up here, and I will continue to, to do that. I'm getting better at this, but I am not perfect at this whatsoever. Uh, I am challenged when I read this story in First Peter 3 about God's patience. And, and, you know, the point of this whole story isn't about Jesus going and preaching to people in hell. It's not about the story of Noah. The point is, help me out, God's patience. That's the whole point of the story. If you want to write down the next thing, the next thing is that Jesus fought so we could be forgiven and free. Uh, Now there's this very interesting comment that Peter makes, and I almost didn't want to talk about this because it's kind of Bible nerding out, but I have to because it's there in the text and it's all part of it. Uh, So in verse 21, uh, Peter says, baptism, which corresponds to this, which what he's actually connecting back to baptism to is Noah's flood. He says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good uh, conscience. Now, what does Peter's comment mean in verse 21 that baptism saves us? Does one have to physically be baptized on this side of heaven in order to enter into the gates of heaven on the other side? Well, many Christian camps would say yes, and they would cite this verse as an example of that, and that would they would also cite Jesus' words in the Great Commission, like Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where he says, go therefore, making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and they'd say, listen, it's the one thing Jesus commanded us to do, and, and you have to do it. That's all also where people would draw theologies about infant baptism and you know they're like hey listen uh, if, if I can just sprinkle this holy water on this little guy or this little girl and she's saved or he's saved man I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll dunk them all the way in if I have to they're gonna I'm, gonna I'm gonna make sure I have to do what I have to do to get them into the kingdom of heaven well I'll tell you I don't think that the act of baptism saves a person And we know this for a lot of different reasons, but in the second half of the sentence, he says it right there. He says, uh, now baptism, which correspond to this, now saves you. And then he says, not as a removal of dirt from the body. In other words, not the part about going in the water and all of that. That's just an act that we do. Uh, The part that is the salvific part is the next part. It says, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, And so it's the appeal to God from the heart that saves a person. I think of the story of the thief on the cross and he's dying there. And uh, if he had to be baptized to be saved, he wouldn't be saved. But Jesus looks at the guy and he says, today you will be with me in paradise. So I would say that baptism is not required for salvation, but I can't think of why a Bible believing Christian would not want to be baptized. It's the one thing that Jesus said, do this. This is important. It's a symbol of your faith. I often say that baptism is just an outward expression of an inward reality that's happened inside of our hearts. And so here in this story or in this, uh, this, this chapter of the Bible, Peter connects the act of baptism to Noah's flood. It's a very strange connection when I think of the fact that everyone who was baptized in Noah's flood, last time I checked, died. In fact, it tells us in 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22, that only eight people survived. So how many of you, if like the next time City Church did a baptism, like like imagine if some of the people we baptized like didn't make it on the other side, you know what I'm saying? It's like, like how many of you would sign up for our next baptism that we're doing? And we'd say, listen, you know what? Uh, 99 out of 100 go on to live productive lives afterwards. Nobody would sign up to do that. So why would Peter connect baptism to a flood where all those people who were baptized died? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons that Peter did this. And the first one is this. I think Peter wants us to think of our old lives like they died. And they never, ever resurfaced. 
And everything that was a part of that life got buried in the bottom of the ocean. And so if you have been physically baptized, that's what it really is all about. When you go down in the water, it's that symbol that your old life is dead. And the new life that you live is now the life you live in Christ. Uh, So Those of us, though, who have been walking with Jesus for any length of time, we quickly learn that the reality of overcoming our sin is more like unwinding a string of webs that's very intertwined, and it can take a long time to grow in some of these areas. But the idea that we should have in our head is that our old life is gone. It's dead. It was buried. And, and the second reason that I think Peter connected the act of baptism to Noah's flood is that it's a reminder of the second chance and the lifeline that is offered to all who believe in Jesus. You know, the eight people who survived Noah's flood, they weren't perfect either, were they? We read about their stories afterwards. They get into some funny stuff. You go ahead and read it on your own, but it's, it's, it's some wacky, wacky stuff. We see their sin, but... Despite that, imagine the gratitude that those people lived with knowing that God gave them a second chance at life. See, that's how we're supposed to think about our lives in light of the reality that we have been, uh, we have been crucified with Christ and that we have been risen with him. Uh, we should wake up every single day and thank God for the fact that he gave us a second chance at life. He rescued us from our old lives. We may not be where we want to be, but thank God we are no longer who we used to be. We should wake up every day and thank God that now we know the better path. See, the difference between you then and you now is then then you didn't know the better path. Now you, in Christ, you know the better path. We should thank God for his forgiveness. We should thank God for our freedom that we have in Christ. Uh, You know, let me tell you something. In 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22, Jesus makes sure, or Peter makes sure that we know that we were not just forgiven, that we are truly free in Christ. Uh, Peter says that baptism is about way more than the removal of dirt from the person's body. It is a response to God for a clean conscience. It's about forgiveness. But God doesn't stop at forgiveness. God goes all the way to making sure that you can know that you can live life with the clean conscience. You know, some of you know that you're forgiven. You learn that. One of the first things you learn when you're a follower of Jesus. But where you struggle is you struggle to find freedom from your past. And if you are in Christ, you've been forgiven and you've been freed. Peter makes sure that those two thoughts are connected. You can live with a clean conscience. And so today I want to tell you that God offers you freedom and he offers you a clean conscience. Jesus suffered so that we could be safe. He's patient when we're on the wrong path and he fought for our forgiveness and for our freedom. I want to leave you with the words from Psalm 103. 11 through 13, it says this. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgression from us. And then check out this next verse. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. That's our father. That's who we serve. You've been forgiven and you've been freed. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for your forgiveness. And I thank you that as a part of that promise of forgiveness is a promise that we can be free. I want to pray right now for anyone who knows they're forgiven but struggles to find freedom from their past. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's an old way of thinking. Maybe it's a bad relationship. Maybe it's just something entirely different, God. You know what it is. God, I wanna pray that we would feel not just your forgiveness, but we would begin to walk in your freedom in our lives. You have set us free. Lord, continue to do it, we pray. And if you're watching this right now, and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. And honestly, you don't know where you'd go when you go to heaven. Go to 
be with the Lord or go the opposite direction. I believe beyond a shadow of doubt that God brought you to this to settle that question. God promises to forgive you of all your sin. He promises to adopt you into his family. He promises to fill you with his Holy Spirit and he promises you an eternal life with him. There's only one catch. Jesus wants the steering wheel of your heart. And so if that's you and you've been window shopping God and the Bible and the claims of Christianity, I wanna give you the opportunity to settle the question once and for all and give Jesus the steering wheel of your heart. It isn't mystical or magical, just pray this with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there and I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your spirit and give me the power to live this life for you. God, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Would you take over? In Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a new song this morning. And our prayer is that this be an encouragement to, to you, that to those who are struggling, to those who have been asking God for something, still waiting, you know that God never fails. He's never failed us yet. How many believe the battle's already won? Let's sing this song. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never change to come knowing the battles won for you have never failed me you promised to stand
I just want you to know that we serve an incredible Father, and so I just pray that you would run into the arms of your Heavenly Father. He is one strong dad! Yeah.